Order members, we now move on to questions to the Minister for the Economy, and I call Jerry Carr. Number one. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the member for his question. The University and College Union, UCU, requested a meeting with me in uh, June 2020 relating to the Further Education Advisory and Oversight Group, which I established in relation to the reopening of colleges. I was unable to fulfil this uh, due to diary commitments. Following the commencement of pay negotiations, further meetings have been requested in relation to the negotiations. However, it would not be appropriate for me to meet the UCU in these circumstances. These are negotiations between the employers, the colleges uh, and the trade union side. I hope that we can find a resolution uh, to the current situation. Both students and lecturers have had an extremely difficult time over the past year and in order to make recovery, we need to focus on skills and the economy, and we need uh, the, everyone uh, to work together to do this. I call Jerry Carr for something minute. Thank you, Minister, for answer. But, Minister, I and many workers in the ECU find it frankly insulting and offensive that you refuse to directly meet them and their reps. At any time, at any level, this is unacceptable, but especially in the middle of a pandemic where workers have worked through it in dispute with their employers. Uh, currently in FE, they are uh, on taking strike action. Not only are you refusing to meet unions and their workers' representatives, but you and your officials have been meeting employers in the same period, meeting one side in the dispute. Member, this question, How can people, these workers and UCU members, have any faith in you being objective and impartial if you are only meeting and refusing to meet one side? Again, um, I would refer uh, the member to um, my uh, previous answer. Um, it is inappropriate um, to meet um, with uh, the union at this particular stage. Um, I and the department will have to act um, with a degree of objectivity in relation to the outcome of those negotiations and the business case that will uh, be brought forward following the negotiations. I would urge both sides to redouble their efforts to bring uh, this to a conclusion. I have already notified the Finance Minister um, and the Department of Finance that uh, there will be a need for additional funding uh, following the conclusion of these negotiations. It is in everybody's interests, lecturers and students, to bring this to a speedy conclusion. And I wish them well in doing that, and I will do my best to work uh, for uh, that end once those uh, negotiations have come to a conclusion. I call John O'Dowd. I would like to thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, I accept a point that it is not the role of the Minister to negotiate in, in relation to industrial disputes, but a meeting with the Minister, whether it is the employer side or the trade union side, can bring a certain atmosphere to negotiations which allow them to be successful. So will the Minister reconsider not meeting the UCU? And I would also urge her to reconsider not meeting the Students' Union, who are also an important voice in our further and higher education lobby? Um, as I say <clears throat> I can only refer uh, the member to my previous uh, answer. I do believe that it is important that we are objective in our role, that we fulfil that role that is a legal responsibility uh, to the full, um, and that uh, the employers, the further education colleges, and the unions can make an appropriate agreement. If that happens, I will not be found wanting in trying to resolve the outstanding issues. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Um, given the flexibility of Zoom, Minister, um, would you commit today to meeting the students' unions uh, in order for them to discuss their particular situation um, in relation to uh, COVID uh, supports? Um, well, of course, um, as the member knows, I do many, many Zoom meetings in the course of a day, um, and um, those sometimes can be very hectic and back-to-back. -back. I have met uh, the students' representatives. I will, of course, meet them in due course again, um, and I know that they have been through a difficult time 
over the past year. That is why I have moved to provide the supports that we have, the most generous support package in the whole of the United Kingdom for students here in Northern Ireland. Moving on, call Mike Nesbitt. Question two. Can I thank the member uh, for his questions? Um, I met uh, with representatives uh, from Excluded NI in September, um, along uh, with um, Stuart Dixon. Um, since then, my officials have continued to engage with them and indeed other organisations as we have developed the COVID-19 supports that local businesses uh, have found uh, invaluable. I will continue to engage with a diverse range of representative organisations as we now focus on economic recovery through the Economic Recovery Action Plan. I call Stuart Dixon. Sorry, Mike, that's what first up on that day. Apologies. Hi. How very dare you. I, I thank the Minister. Uh, for, for the answer, I think Excluded NI would be interested to know, with regard to the uh, COVID restrictions business support scheme Part B, uh, when your department intends to release payments for the period beginning the 31st of March. Thank you. Um, my department have, uh, of course, been continuing um, to. Um, uh, release payments in relation to all of the schemes. Indeed, um, only recently we sought executive agreement for the extension of Part B of the scheme um, that he refers to so that people could avail of it right up until the 23rd of May when we hope to see uh, the lifting of uh, many of the restrictions that hold businesses back. And Michael Stewart. Um, thank you very much, Minister, uh, um, and thank you, Mr. Nesbitt, for bringing forward the question. Um, yes, indeed, Minister, you did meet with Excluded NI, and since that time, uh, sterling work has been done um, in the background between them and many of the organisations and schemes that you have been working with uh, and through. Can I ask you today, Minister, uh, have you further plans to support both the events and wedding industry in Northern Ireland as we emerge from the, the COVID pandemic, uh, and how they will fit into your recovery plans? Well, the member quite rightly um, identifies some of the very core issues. In Northern Ireland, we have identified and plugged gaps of support that were not um, and have not been plugged right across uh, the United Kingdom. So things like the Limited Company Director Support Scheme, um, which uh, to date has paid out £10.1 million, um, has been a very invaluable scheme uh, that uh, was recognised as a gap in the support um, that uh, we had put together. Um, in relation to events and weddings and so on, it is um, absolutely clear that the best way to support all of these um, aspects of our economy is to have our economy open, functioning and operating normally. I look forward um, to the 24th when I hope that we will see another step change in that reopening and that recovery. Um, because that is where people want to be, um, and that is where we must uh, support um, sectors of the economy. I call Gemma Dolan. Minister, the stringent criteria applied by your department in relation to the recently self-employed scheme excluded those who became self-employed after March 2020. In light of the £2.5 million underspend in this scheme, Will you now consider widening the criteria so that more newly self-employed people can receive support? Again, can I uh, thank the member for her uh, question? And she will um, acknowledge um, that we looked at the newly self-employed support scheme a number of times um, and widened and extended the criteria so that it um, actually included a wider um, range of people. Um, we now have um, around um, 3,009 applications to that scheme. 2,481 have been paid, and that totals 8.7 million. 
This has been an invaluable support to those who were newly um, self-employed and who missed out um, on uh, aspects of the core COVID uh, recovery schemes. As I said uh, to Mr Dixon, the focus now should be for my department and indeed for this House uh, more generally um, to actually get uh, the recovery up, going and running as fast as we can. Today, almost 100,000 people still rely on the furlough scheme for wages in Northern Ireland, and we can only reduce that number, and we can only stave off a spike in unemployment if we get the economy open. And I call Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your question. So far, Minister, how many businesses have had their applications to C or BSS uh, Part A and Part B rejected? Um, I um, can, of course, write to the member with this precise figure um, in relation to that. Um, but we have, up until uh, now, paid out 83.3 million. Um, part A, that has included over 6,000 uh, applications. 5,086 of those have been paid. Um, some have been rejected and some are still awaiting additional information. But I will write to you with the absolutely specific uh, figure in relation to that. In relation to Part B, 2,387 applications have been submitted, 1,551 paid, and that again is for the same uh, reasons, um, either a lack of information or ineligible under the criteria. Um, I do commend the staff at Invest NI, who um, have generally responded very efficiently to queries from, I think, members of this House and indeed members of the general public and the level of funding that they have actually put into the economy, which I think through grants at the moment stands at around 120 million that they have administered. Moving on, I call Gary Middleton. Question number three, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Speaker, um, I would ask for your indulgence and to have just one minute additional to answer this question because I think it is fundamentally important as we go forward. So can I thank uh, my colleague for uh, his question. Since I launched my Economic Recovery Action Plan on the 25th of February, I have been successful in securing an additional £286 million um, in the 2021-22 year to deliver this Economic Recovery Action Plan. On the 21st of April, my department hosted a virtual stakeholder event to continue the discussion on recovery because I believe that partnership and collaboration are key to the successful delivery of the actions set out in the plan. On the 30th of April, I announced further details of the High Street Stimulus Scheme and the Holiday at Home Voucher Scheme. Both of these schemes are cornerstones of the plan. The timing of their delivery will help maintain the recovery momentum that has started with the reopening of businesses across Northern Ireland. On the Green Economy Agenda, I have published the Options Consultation on a New Energy Strategy, and this includes progressing key actions relating to renewable energy, energy efficiency, the hydrogen economy and green innovation. On the skills agenda, pilot activity has commenced to test how the flexible skills fund could be utilised to support upskilling. The development of additional upskilling and reskilling interventions is also underway. This is particularly important, Mr Deputy Speaker, when we consider the number of people who are still on furlough or who still have their employment supported through the self-employed scheme. I will continue to work hard to deliver the themes set out in the plan, but it is worth indicating to the House that within this plan, an additional £31 million has been allocated to skills, education and support, an additional £10 million for university research and development, £145 million for the High Street Stimulus Scheme, £2 million for the Holiday at Home Voucher Scheme, £20 million for advertising and marketing for tourism and hospitality, and £17 million for tourism support programmes. 
an additional £15 million to maximise North Invest NI's external growth opportunities, and an additional £1 million for cross-border programmes, an additional £6 million for air, to support air connectivity, and innovation and digital innovation, an additional £3 million. Entrepreneurship has, uh, will receive um, and uh, support for SMEs will receive an additional £3.5 million. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your time. I call Gary Middleton for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for that detailed update and indeed thank her for uh, taking the time to visit Londonderry Chamber of Commerce very recently. A key element of the Minister's economic recovery plan is the High Street um, stimulus scheme or the, the, the High Street uh, voucher scheme. Uh, can the Minister provide a bit more detail about that particular scheme, which we hope will uh, provide a stimulus to our High Street? Yes, and it was good um, to visit um, in the city. Um, we had a, a lovely day um, and saw some really innovative um, plans uh, to take the city forward, whether that was an innovation at Catalyst or indeed um, down um, on the Loch Shores looking um, at the new uh, environmental scheme there. Really, um, really encouraged. The, as I have indicated, we have £145 million, um, that has been guaranteed for the High Street Stimulus Scheme. Um, we are now proceeding with the procurement and impl implementation of that scheme. We have also undertaken some research um, to um, let us um, have some evidence base for when is the best time to roll out that scheme. And it would appear that to encourage spending after the summer months and the, and the initial pent-up demand that we see in the shops now, that at the end of the summer, beginning of autumn, would be the best time to actually roll that out. This will be a prepaid card worth £100 to every adult over 18, and all are eligible to apply. The only stipulation is that it must be used in bricks and mortar businesses in Northern Ireland and not online. It is what it says in the title. It is about stimulating business on the high street and supporting the retail sector, which has um, suffered enormously over the COVID pandemic. I call Kiva Archibald. I thank the, the Minister for her responses so far and I, I also want to ask about the High Street Voucher Scheme uh, because half of the funding for economic recovery ha is going towards that scheme and last week at the Economy Committee we heard from officials around it and they weren't able to confirm what it could be spent on or where and um, what the economic impact of it would be. So just given what you have said around the timescales for delivering it hopefully at the end of the summer, are you confident that will, it will be ready to be rolled out at that time? We are already well advanced um, in uh, working towards the procurement of the provider for the cards. Um, I would hope that we will be able to deliver that out at the end of the summer, at the beginning of autumn. Um, and furthermore, I want to have the time over the summer to work with uh, local chambers, local towns, local businesses, because we want this to be a scheme that actually supports the local high street. It isn't about um, the, the, the online shop, it isn't about, it is about the bricks and mortar high street. People from our communities who actually have invested um, within uh, their businesses um, and who um, last year were probably closed longer than they were um, open. So um, we will be taking a very, very strong shop local message with the High Street Voucher Scheme um, and will be working extensively with groups, even those who are hard to reach and might find it difficult to access the scheme, to ensure that it is open and available to everyone. I call Sinead McLaughlin. <coughs> Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. And I just want to touch on the High Street uh, Voucher Scheme as well. There are many variables um, in, in this scheme. Uh, but has your department done an impact assessment um, in relation to uh, how, how it is going to benefit the overall economy? And how will we recognise that it has been a success or failure? But I don't suspect it will be a failure. But how, how do we uh, measure that? Uh, and can, if you've done the assessment, will you be a publishing that I think assessment. There's a number of questions there. <laughs> <Yeah. Mr. laughs> 
I, I am. Um, this is a scheme that has clearly caught the imagination not only of people here in Northern Ireland, but actually um, I've been approached about this uh, from Scotland and from a, a very, very wide variety of people. Um, we have looked at and uh, completed a business case around the scheme. Um, we um, will uh, be then doing an impact assessment of the scheme, but where similar schemes have rolled out, it is absolutely clear from the data that have come from them that this has increased spend in the high street. Um, and remember, by the end of, end of August, September, we will see the end of the furlough scheme, potential uh, greater difficulties within the economy, and we want to continue to stimulate the high street right uh, throughout uh, the autumn period and into Christmas. So we hope that there will be a multiplier effect from the scheme, that if perhaps people get £100, they will be actually um, purchasing items that will be, be more than that, and that it will encourage them to continue to support local shops in local towns and local businesses. And I call Michelle McLevin. For Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the member uh, for her question? It is indeed uh, timely and very important. Um, as we mark the centenary of Northern Ireland, we in the department will use it as a time to reflect on our past successes as a small country leading the world in shipbuilding, ropeworks and linen production, to where we are now as global leaders in cybersecurity, tech startups, fintech, and with the creative industry sector producing TV and films which are broadcast across the world. The qualities that marked our industrial endeavour in the past are still very much evident today – innovation, determination and vision. And we have seen that in abundance over the past year, as businesses pivot, repurpose production lines or step up to provide much needed materials as part of our response to the challenges of the pandemic. This has been a difficult year for Northern Ireland, and the centenary gives us an ideal platform to showcase everything that is great about Northern Ireland and why it is a great place to live, work and invest, and act as a springboard for economic recovery. Despite the ongoing restrictions in some parts of the globe, we have an ambitious series of events scheduled, including an international investment conference here at the beginning of next year. Invest NI, Tourism Ireland and Screen NI all have a series of events to mark the centenary and give us standout from other regions. As we build our second century, I look forward to working with stakeholders from across Northern Ireland to help shape our future economy and create a place attractive to investors, recognised globally and a place which creates opportunities at home for people from all backgrounds and communities across Northern Ireland. I call Michelle McLevy. Well, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Can the Minister confirm whether any bids were made for funding to mark the centenary and to outline what her priorities are as we build for Northern Ireland's second century? Yes, uh, my departments did uh, make bids to the Department of Finance as part of the NDNA process. Um, we have not heard back from the Department in relation to those bids. However, um, we have identified funds within the Department um, which we will use uh, along with um, the Northern Ireland Office uh, to fund the investment conferences um, and uh, the work that we will be doing um, to showcase Northern Ireland. As we um, celebrate Northern Ireland's centenary, um, and as we move into the second centenary for Northern Ireland, um, I want that economy to be one um, of innovation, inclusion, and as I said in my uh, first answer, uh, one where people can feel at home and feel that they can have a prosperous and settled life. I call Jim Alistair. I call Jim Alistair. Sorry, thank you. Just didn't hear. Thank you. Um, so the minister says bids were made. A couple of weeks ago, the finance minister told me in this house that he could recall no bids from any department to mark the centenary. So could the minister elaborate on what bids were made and to what extent, and indeed what funds have been set aside 
within her department to mark the centenary? And does she agree that it's beyond shameful that here in the seat of government there's not going to be so much as a rose bush to mark the centenary, such as the bigotry? The, the, the of member Sinn has Fein. asked a number of questions. Minister. Um, yes, um, I, certainly in relation to the last part of your question, I do think that the coverage I read in the papers over the weekend um, was uh, both petty um, and indeed um, not worthy uh, of uh, people who claim that they want an agreed Ireland for everyone to live in. It appears that it's only for certain folks who uh, organise and, and who conform uh, to what uh, is required. I think that if we are to make this place home, we need to make it a place where we can all live, work um, and uh, express our identity. Um, I have made bids uh, to the Minister. Those were part of the NDNA process, but I have also um, pro there was a series of bids in relation to NDNA. Um, but I also have uh, identified funding within my department, which I will use uh, alongside funding that we have secured from the Northern Ireland Office for the investment conference, which I think is hugely, hugely important as we take the Northern Ireland economy forward. Um, I will also, um, and have been working um, indeed with the Northern Ireland Office, to increase Northern Ireland's footprint globally across the world. Um, and we have secured uh, some more funding um, to around eight million to actually um, have Northern Ireland represented in growing economies across the world so that we can make the connections that help us to develop the economy. Um, our um, arms length bodies in Invest NI and uh, in Screen NI have also a series uh, of events coming up. And of course, one of the important things that I want to revitalise is that ambassador programme across the world for Northern Ireland. Many of the people who come here to invest do so because they have a personal connection or know someone with a personal connection. And we want to really utilise um, that ambassador programme right across the world. I look forward to rolling these out. And of course, everyone in this House will recognise that with Minister's COVID time is up. sorry, well, sorry, just one second. With COVID and restrictions, that has been difficult in a difficult year. I call Matthew to Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. We won't agree on the exact nature of uh, what we're commemorating and celebrating centenary, but we all going forward, certainly I want to see maximum investment and maximum opportunity in Northern Ireland. Would the Minister therefore agree with me, given she's talked about an investment conference? that the best way to celebrate the duality and unique nature of this place is to highlight at that investment conference our access to both the UK and EU market of half a billion people via the Northern Ireland Protocol, and will she commit to inv instructing Invest and I to maximise Minister. that opportunity? Minister. I think that we may not agree um, on the centenary of Northern Ireland, but I think we should and can all agree that we want a place that is prosperous for all of our people. I um, am really looking forward to, we are already working on some elements of the investment conference um, that we are going to do uh, at the start of the year, and a little taster of one that we will do in London earlier in the year, um, or, at the start of, or at the end of this year. Um, and that is really, really important. But again, the member must realise that investors come to Northern Ireland for a very wide range of reasons. And that includes the skills of our people, the cost base in Northern Ireland, the standard of living, the standard of education. And it is all of those reasons that they come to Northern Ireland to invest, uh, not on just one single element of it. And of course, we have to be absolutely clear that investors come where they have strong supply chains. And if those supply chains are broken by the protocol, then that is a problem as we go forward. And I call Cahill for them. The last one from Kest Ever Coog. Let her hold question number five, please. Um, can I thank uh, the member um, for his question and, and indeed for his very obvious interest uh, in this particular issue? Project Stratum is the largest telecommunications infrastructure project undertaken by my department and will utilise public funding secured under the Confidence and Supply Agreement together with Fibrous Networks investment 
to deliver gigabit capable broadband infrastructure to more than 76,000 primarily rural premises across Northern Ireland. Following contract award in November 2020, the deployment of infrastructure commenced immediately. Work is underway in the first five deployment areas, Coal Island, Killyleigh, Ballycastle, Kilkee and Castle Wellen. And indeed, I had the, the great pleasure uh, of talking to uh, people in Coal Island who had been the first uh, to be connected through this. To date, Fibrous Networks has completed work in some 1,041 premises <coughs> through Project Stratum, with more premises to benefit from access to improved broadband services shortly. Fibrous Networks has a target of connecting approximately 19,500 premises in 2021 and is currently on track to achieve this. In Newry and Armagh, and I know the me member will be hugely interested in this, 8,101 premises <coughs> will be connected um, under Project Stratum. When this is complete, that will mean that 99.5% um, of his constituency will have access to superfast broadband. And that ends our period of time for listed questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Gemma Dolan. Minister, the NDNA contain commitments on workers' rights, including ways to create decent jobs that give workers a meaningful voice and input into government policy development. How will you ensure this commitment is delivered on and is and in cooperation with trade unions and workers' representatives? Um, again, I, I want to thank the member for her question and to just inform the House um, that this today, this morning, I actually signed off the final draft um, of uh, the first piece of legislation that we will do in this House around uh, rights for workers, and that is the parental bereavement uh, leave um, bill. And I hope that this will uh, be agreed at the executive this week and will reach the floor of this House very, very quickly. It is hugely important in giving um, parents statutory rights in such a, a difficult situation. The Department is also working on another wider range of uh, measures um, around employment rights. Um, and looking at many of the issues that have come uh, to the fore, and indeed over the last year. Um, and those will include things like hire and fire, a practice um, that uh, is, I think, quite wrong, um, and where employers should take the time to explain what they need to do and how they, if they need to restructure to actually do that without impacting on workers' rights. So we will be bringing a much wider range of measures which will cover a wider uh, range of employment uh, rights um, in, as, as soon as we get the first piece of legislation through, which is the parental bereavement leave. I call Gemma Dolan for supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her answer. That's very welcome news about the parental bereavement leave. And on the fire and hire um, issue, Will you commit to bringing forward legislation to end this disgraceful exploitation of workers? Well, as I have indicated, I don't think that this is a practice that many of us in this House um, will support. Um, we want to see people treated fairly, um, in line with the conditions that they have signed up to um, in um, their, their workplace. And uh, right now, if uh, anyone feels that they have been treated unfairly or illegally, um, then I would advise them to seek advice either through the Law Centre or indeed through the Labour Relations Agency, because it is important uh, that we protect um, everyone uh, in this society. As I've said, I'm also uh, working on a wider range of employment issues, and these will come to the House in due course. I call Kiva Archibald. Margaret Last can call you and Minister, I, I too um, welcome the, the news about the parental bereavement leave bill. Um, last week, Minister, I had a, a response from yourself indicating that Invest NI had identified over 30 new potential inward investment opportunities since the beginning of the year, which is obviously a significant number. Um, can I ask if you will bring forward a strategy to maximise our potential um, of our unique access to the EU single market and our ability to continue to sell goods into it? 
Well, as I said in a, a previous answer, um, investors come to Northern Ireland um, for a very, very wide variety of reasons, and that can be around the standard of living, the skills of our people. Indeed, many um, investors that I've spoken to as they come to Northern Ireland talk about that collaboration between university and business that is so important uh, to the future of the economy. Many come because of the clusters of innovation that we now have within our economy. So it is not just about one thing, it is about the whole offering that the Northern Ireland economy can give. And of course, in relation to the protocol, we must absolutely sort out the damage that the protocol is doing to those supply chains and those businesses that I write weekly to Lord Frost about and the difficulties they are encountering with their trade from GB to NI. I call Kiva Archibald. For her response, and, and I'm sure we'd all like to see the, the challenges posed um, by Brexit for businesses being resolved as quickly as possible. Um, a report recently from FSB in Britain showed that 10% of businesses that were surveyed were looking for warehousing space here in the north. And last week, Manufacturing and NI published a survey which showed nearly half of businesses were wanting the executive to identify and secure new opportunities for their businesses. So, do you accept that there is a need for a coordinated strategy to support businesses to respond to the challenges that they face? because of Brexit, but also to maximise the potential opportunities that are there under the protocol? Well, of course, many of the, the, the difficulties that businesses encounter are not because of Brexit, they are actually because of the protocol. And they are because parties in this House voted um, and uh, have stridently um, asked for the rigorous implementation of that protocol, even though 75 per cent of businesses in the same survey acknowledged that they had difficulties with their supply chains and businesses um, in GB. So we really do need to look at the whole picture for investment in Northern Ireland. And we need to offer people a holistic uh, view of what Northern Ireland has to offer. And I do hope that government is listening and will listen, and indeed that the EU will stop uh, on this um, stubborn trajectory of punishing Northern Ireland um, and not helping it, um, as it claimed so many times in the past it was willing to do. And now call Michelle McElveen. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I note that the Minister launched a stay-at-home tourism campaign today. And while I welcome and understand why this was necessary, could I ask the Minister if she would agree with me that we need to see, at the very least, travel opened up across the common travel area and allow our tourism sector to begin marketing Northern Ireland in key GB sectors? Um, I absolutely do um, agree with the member on this point. Um, I today have launched the Northern Ireland uh, uh, tourism campaign for the summer because we know that realistically the vast majority of our businesses and, and the business that comes to our hotels um, and our hospitality sector will be from the home market. So it is to encourage people to explore Northern Ireland, to get out and about and see um, maybe things that they have forgotten about, I lost contact with um, over the past number of years. And I very much hope that that campaign will be successful. However, there is not enough business in Northern Ireland to sustain our economy or to grow tourism if we only rely on the home market. And therefore, it is very, very strange that we are the only part of the United Kingdom that has the guidance um, within uh, the health uh, guidance that uh, if someone should come here, um, that they would have to isolate for 10 days. It is guidance, Mr. Speaker, um, but nevertheless impossible to go into the GB market with a tourism campaign with such guidance in place. I look forward to, and I have discussed this issue with executive colleagues, and I look forward to Northern Ireland being treated equally across the common travel area and certainly with those areas in the rest of the United Kingdom. That is important for business. I call Michelle McVean for supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her response. But given the rates of infection here in comparison with the mainland, could I ask the Minister what she believes to be the rationale of restricting travel across the common travel area? Um, and uh, again, um, this is a matter I have discussed um, with colleagues. Um, Northern Ireland has a, higher rate, a, a low rate of infection, but comparatively higher um, than uh, England, Scotland or Wales. 
um, and therefore that cannot be the reason for restricting travel uh, from uh, GB to Northern Ireland. Um, of course, we are wary and want to protect um, from um, some of the COVID variants that we have heard about. But again, many of these COVID variants are either um, in the Republic or they're actually um, already uh, in GB um, in Scotland, England and Wales, and yet their infection rates are lower. I don't think that we can continue with this situation. And for the sake um, of our people, um, for the sake of allowing family and friends to visit, for the sake of allowing businesses to grow and allowing us to get into the GB market with a, a good campaign for the summer, we need to review this across uh, the common travel area. I now call Melissa McHugh. Grandma, I got last from Carla. Uh, Minister, uh, in your recent announcement uh, in relation to the holiday at home vouchers, uh, you stated that it would be allocated on a first come, first serve basis. Uh, now, what in fact are you implementing there to ensure that it has uh, equality assessed? Um, so it, it is, um, I, and I am really um, absolutely adamant um, that we get to a situation where we are supporting tourism and hospitality because of the absolutely dramatic and terrible impacts on that part of our economy. Um, through COVID. Over 70,000 jobs are at stake in this part of the economy, many of them part-time, many of them with women, many of them with young people who do part-time hours in order to support themselves um, at college and so on. So therefore, within um, my um, Economic Recovery Action Plan, I have a number of schemes um, that are there to uh, support um, uh, this particular sector. The holiday at home voucher scheme is one of those. There is a budget of two million for this scheme, um, and that is obviously a finite amount of money. Um, and when um, we have, um, I suppose it's done, it's done. Um, so therefore, it will be on a first come, first serve basis. Um, I hope that people will be able uh, to avail of it, um, and I hope that it will continue again, like the high street stimulus scheme, to stimulate demand um, within that part of the economy so that we continue to help it to recover. I would also remind uh, the member that we have allocated £20 million for advertising and marketing and £17 million for other tourism support programmes, and this along with the money that is within the city deals, which will be a medium-term objective of recovery for tourism, will mean that once again we will get to that high water mark that we achieved in 2019. I call Melissa McHugh for a supplementary. Thank you for your answer, Minister. But uh, in your answer, I'm still not convinced that there is any system in place there to ensure that it is a quality assessed one way or the other. But notwithstanding that, Minister, um, can I also uh, continue then that uh, you have also selected a number of tourist attractions and accommodation providers uh, that um, uh, would be part and parcel of. Um, the voucher scheme as well. Now, how will you ensure that that impact is spread fairly throughout the six counties, in particular, I think, again, of my own region in West Tyrone, where there's many a lovely uh, and attractive site there that uh, would benefit from the scheme as well? Well, the objective of this is to try to spread um, the tourism offer and therefore the benefit um, from tourism. And obviously, it will have a dramatic impact on the North Coast and the Fermanagh Lakelands, um, maybe in South Down and, and in other you know, more uh, well-known areas. But this is available to everyone and every part of Northern Ireland and is part of uh, not just the recovery of tourism and hospitality, but it is part of the our aim and objective of what we are trying to do with the Economic Recovery Action Plan of ensure that we have a regionally balanced economy that everyone can prosper in. I call the <coughs> Dillon. Gormaya, Privlesh, Cancorlia. Minister, we have recently met with um, Fibris, who are obviously the, the provider of Project Stratum, and we have been made aware by people in our own constituency, and I believe this is an issue right across the north, that people have been left out of the scheme because either the LPS had not confirmed that there were 
there was somebody living in the property, but also because speeds that were not accurate were being given to the, the department or to the provider. And people were being told they're getting over 30, when in some cases they're not even getting too many. Can, the can, you, can you tell us how you're going to address this, please? Um, again, this is a, a really and a, a hugely uh, important area um, who, for, for those people who have been excluded from the target intervention area um, and indeed for those people for whom we received um, incorrect uh, data from land and property services. And we are working um, on this particular issue. Um, we are trying to identify additional funding within the state aid envelope that we have for the scheme um, to ensure that we have more funding uh, to bring uh, more people into uh, the, the target uh, area and to make sure that we are not uh, excluding anyone. Having said that, and these are really important issues which um, we are, con we are um, at this moment in the department working on. This is a massive scheme, the largest infrastructure project that has under, been undertaken in Northern Ireland. Um, it has been made possible through the confidence and supply funding of £165 million, with additional investment from Fibrous um, to add uh, to uh, the value of the scheme. Um, and it is exciting that at the end of this, Northern Ireland will have one of the most advanced networks in the whole of Europe. And that concludes our period of time for topical questions. I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments before we return to the climate change bill uh, and we change uh, those at the top table.